Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. All right, welcome back. This is Tim Fisher from Purdue, and we're here for the last lecture of week one of the course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale, which is a Nano Hub U course. And today I'm going to kind of wrap up the concepts that we went through quite quickly during the week. I'll try to do this. Most weeks we'll have sort of a wrap up lecture at the end. Um, and it's not entirely a review. A lot of times I want to add a couple of things to the way that uh, something was described uh, during the week or maybe another example, a quick example, something like that. So hopefully it's useful to you. Usually when we teach subjects, we like to kind of go back every once in a while and, and uh, talk about what we've, what we've discussed earlier so that we can reinforce the concepts. So this is our big problem. Uh, we don't want to lose sight of it. And uh, generally speaking, by the end of this course, we should be able to solve for heat transfer in a device that's connected to hot and cold temperature reservoirs and uh, really understand all of the possible nuances. If the device is very long or very short, if it's wide, if it's thin, uh, what kind of carriers are active thermally in the device. And so the bottom equation here, we, we haven't derived it. We've just talked about it a little bit. But generally speaking, we're going to represent the rate of heat flow, Q, as a, an integral of a series of products. One of those is the number of modes, and that contains the velocity and something called the density of states. We've talked a little bit about the carrier velocity. The second term is the energy. Um, in this case, it's sort of written, it, this integral is written in frequency space, so it generally applies to phonons, but also we could think of electrons as having frequency, and h bar omega is their energy. We talked about that. The third term is the transmission function. That'll be sort of the last thing that we dive into. Uh, and then this difference factor, uh, f minus f, that is the difference in the distribution functions of the carriers. So uh, we just have kind of started on a few of these, of these factors. Um, and we'll go through some of the things that we did in the first week um, throughout the remainder of this lecture. We first talked about how electrons, or rather how atoms bond together through electrons. And we noticed that uh, the Pauli exclusion principle plays a big role because as when atoms come together, they can't share, their electrons cannot share the same exact energy space, at least if they have the same spin. And so that we have to do something called hybridize these energy levels. And that creates things like electron bands. And in some cases, we can have uh, these, these bands that overlap, and they form sort of a sea of electrons. And that's what produces a metal. Uh, there are other kinds of bonds that we talked about um, for that, for example, predominate insulators and semiconductors. Um, but the, the general thinking here is that we have to do something about these energy states of the electrons which, by the way, are very important in the study of thermal transport because thermal transport has to access those, uh, those energy states, at least if we're going to use the electrons to do so. We simplified the general problem. We kind of took that, that two-atom bond and said, well, imagine if the atoms were uh, uh, in a chain, and there were many of them, and we would represent those bonds uh, a little bit uh, simplistically, uh, we would represent them as a spring uh, with a spring constant G. And that spring constant G is going to be very important for most of what we do. Um, so this spring constant G will control the vibrational aspects of the, of the atomic chain or in multiple dimensions, the, the two-dimensional material or the three-dimensional bulk material. We're going to focus on the simple linear chain because it is it, it gives us almost all of the mathematical tools that we'll need to to solve these the problems of lattice vibrations and how lattice vibrations can carry thermal energy. A couple of definitions that are important. First of all, the lattice constant is in this case uh, the same as the interatomic spacing, and we're going to call that A. And also the atomic mass M is very important. When we define a lattice, this is a lattice in real space, we will define its translation vector as a vector, which is just the lattice constant times the direction. In this case, we've chosen the x direction to be uh, aligned with the chain. 
We then introduced this concept of the reciprocal lattice, and the reason we did so is that we want to be able to capture very, very long wavelengths. In fact, wavelengths that essentially go out to infinity in, in distance. Um, and to do so, then, we would have to integrate over real space to infinity in three dimensions if we wanted to solve useful problems. And that's cumbersome. It can be done in certain circumstances, but it's much easier to actually invert real space and to create something called reciprocal space. So this reciprocal space is the, is the inverse of the lattice that I showed on the previous slide, which is called the Brevet lattice, generally. Um, and this inverse space takes those infinitely long wavelengths and it inverts them so that those become zero or close to zero in reciprocal space. And then our upper bound for reciprocal space will be roughly the interatomic spacing. So what we do, and this is a three-dimensional example, um, we, we will define a uh, reciprocal lattice vector G that is the sum of these vectors B that are defined down here in terms of those A vectors that I showed on the previous slide. Of course, in one dimension, it's very simple. There's only one A vector. Um, but in, in multiple dimensions, it can be actually quite geometrically complicated. And we didn't go through examples of that. And many times, if you read solid state textbooks, sort of the first thing that they do is a lot of crystallography. I want to avoid that as much as we can. We'll do what we need to. Um, but that is a point of confusion, and it really takes some time for those very complicated geometric concepts to sink in. So what I've done here is we've taken graphene, and we didn't show this before, um, but the graphene lattice we mentioned has uh, a, is a lattice with a basis atom. So we have a primary atom and a basis atom, and its translation vectors A1 and A2 are shown here. If you marched around all of real space in two dimensions, and put a lattice point wherever A1 or A2 arrow tips hit, and then we add them together in an integer way, we would fill the real space with all of the atoms. Now remember, the basis atom is the one that I'm hovering over here, and I'll circle that for you. So this is where the basis atom sits relative to our origin in this figure. Now if we go and apply that reciprocal lattice vector concept to this two-dimensional problem, and this will be something I really encourage you to do on your own mathematically, then what we find is that we obtain a reciprocal space lattice that's also hexagonal, although you'll notice that it's rotated um, relative to the real space lattice, and I have vectors B1 and B2. Now if I march through reciprocal space, I form, again, a, essentially a hexagonal pattern. In this case, we have a center node, however, um, and then if I take, let's say that we focus on a node right over here, this is our, our node of interest, and we draw the reciprocal lattice regions that are closest to that particular point, that will become the, what's called the first Brillouin zone in reciprocal space. And that's very important because what we also found was that these, these solutions for vibrational states, for example, uh, they were repeating throughout the reciprocal space. In other words, I only needed to be inside of one of these little cells that's kind of grayed out in, in blue here, uh, light blue. I only need to be in one of those cells. All the other ones are exactly the same. And this is really nice. It, it kind of maps real space back into one small zone that we can analyze mathematically. Now, if we go through this, this central point of this reciprocal lattice space, this, this cell, um, is called the gamma point. Just for those of you who've seen some uh, solid state physics, you might re recall that. For graphene, there's some really important points. The vertices around the first Brillouin zone here are called the K points, and that's actually where there's a really interesting electronic behavior. We, essentially, the electrons become what they call massless. We're not going to go through that but, um, but it's, that's, that's really where a lot of interest um, in modern technology lies. So, what we really want to do with that one-dimensional chain of atoms is to understand how the atoms vibrate. And we went through some math, and here we've kind of jumped into the middle of the solution that we went through, and we said that, well, we can relate the frequency of vibration to this wave vector K. So, 
K, capital K is for phonons, we'll use lowercase k for electrons. Uh, and we solve for this frequency, and we find it's a very simple relationship that the frequency goes as a sinusoidal function of k, and this is what we call the dispersion relation, and this is for acoustic phonons. So we called them acoustic phonons at the time, not really knowing why, maybe, um, but eventually we said that as in the low k limit, or that's the long wavelength limit, uh, the the dispersion relation gives us the speed of sound for these for this uh, type of phonon. So these are the acoustic phonons. Uh, that's why they're called that. So now we go through. We look at this, and again, that solution is periodic. So I only have to be in the region of k space between minus pi over a and pi over a. Actually, we only need to be in a region of k-space that whose width is 2 pi over a. It doesn't matter what we choose. Uh, but by convention, we choose the region with uh, k equals 0 at the middle. And this becomes our first Brillouin zone. Now, up to this point, we'd really focused on classical understanding of these vibrations. But in fact, these vibrations are quantized. And so we had to make a, a little bit of a change, and, and we didn't go through in detail all of the quantum mechanics or the solution to the Schrodinger's equation, but we do recognize that solution of the Schrodinger equation in its steady form, its time invariant form, will give us the energy eigenvectors. And so these energy eigenvectors are related to um, h bar omega, so, so an energy of, the energy of a phonon is h bar times its frequency, h bar being reduced Planck's constant. And then we said that, well, there's a number of possible phonons that fill a given state. That means a given wave vector and frequency. And so we have to represent that somehow. And that gets a little bit into the statistics of the problem. We're not quite there yet. But we do recognize that that number n sub k is the number of phonons. And it only can in increase in increments of h bar omega. Its energy can increase in increments of h bar omega. The way to think about that is to go back to our our bond uh, drawing of potential versus separation r. And we see here that uh, the, the classical result would give us sort of a continuum of possible positions r relative to potential energy capital U, but the quantization actually restricts those sites uh, and the separation between those allowable states is h bar omega. So you can kind of think of this, there's a relationship between the amplitude of oscillation and the energy, and we actually went and derived that um, as well. So I didn't include it in the review today, but that's something that um, you rarely see done, and I think it, it really does help um, to give the, the students a, a good intuition about the relationship between quantum vibrations and classical vibrations. So then we went and we talked about electrons and we provided the caveat that there's been several other courses in NanoHub U that really focus on electronic transport and we are not going to be looking deeply into those uh, into those subjects with the uh, gated transport uh, field effect transistors and the like. Um, we're interested in electrons because they often control the thermal properties of materials, especially metals. So we're going to focus on this left example where we have two bands, these come from the bonding of atoms, that overlap, and when they do, then the electrons in general have the ability to kind of float over the ions without really feeling them, and so we call these free electrons. When we had, once we had sort of assumed free electrons, we can solve Schrodinger's equation for electrons, which we did, um, again, assuming that there were no ionic interactions. And we solved the classic particle in a box problem. And we found that electrons, just like phonons, have these wave vectors. We're going to call these lowercase k, the, the electron wave vectors lowercase k, just to distinguish them, just so that you know when we use lowercase k, we're talking about electrons. And when we use uppercase k, we're talking about phonons. The reciprocal space is the same for each. But I want to make sure that in, in the context of what we derive, um, we have some way of distinguishing between whether we're dealing with phonons or electrons. We did notice here that once we have this allow these allowable states in k-space, again, this was for three dimensions, each 
k-space state is separated by a distance of 2 pi over l from its nearest allowable state in that uh, or along that axis. And so if we look at, if we kind of populated k-space with allowable states, we would find that each point, each allowable state in k-space occupies a region of 2 pi over l all cubed of k-space. And that became important because what we wanted to do is use that and the knowledge of how many free electrons we have, which is going to come from our material properties. That, that will be sort of a given in the problem. We can say, well, if I have this many electrons, they each occupy this much volume of k-space, I can calculate some metrics about how th those electrons fill the k-space. And once we know how it fills k-space, we, we can understand how it fills energy space. And that produces, uh, that analysis produces um, something called the Fermi metrics. And the most famous one is the Fermi energy, which is given here. Here, eta sub e is the electron density. That's the number of electrons per unit volume. The Fermi velocity, again, and the Fermi temperature all derive from this type of analysis. Lastly, we went back to phonons uh, with an example. We said, well, there's, there's actually a lot more complication to the study of phonons than what we can glean from that one-dimensional chain, although the end result is generally the same for multiple dimensions, except for one caveat. When we add another atom to a unit cell. So here we have in these dashed regions, we have two atoms per unit cell. Now our lattice constant is twice as large uh, because, again, the lattice has to be symmetric, and so or a unit cell has to be symmetric so that the lattice constant spans from one unit cell to the other. It has to include all of the, all of the uniqueness of the lattice inside it. So we now have the second atom we had to do a slight modification of our potential en energy relationship. That's the relationship between potential energy and local atomic displacements and the spring constant G. And when we did that, we ended up with maybe something a little bit unexpected. The addition of that second atom actually produces a new branch. So the dispersion relation that we derived from our mechanical dynamic analysis of that lattice with a two atom basis, uh, that produced a second branch. So we actually had a plus and minus in our dispersion relation, uh, a plus and minus of a term, and that produces still that same type of acoustic branch. That's one of those branches, but the other one is the optical branch. And so from this, we said, well, there's different kinds of phonons that we'll have to deal with. And we'll, we'll leave it at that for now, but we'll recognize that these optical, this, these optical phonons tend to have a flat dispersion, which means that they don't have a very high group velocity because group velocity is the derivative of frequency with respect to wave vector. So here, this is almost zero. The, the group velocity for this case is almost zero, whereas in the acoustic branch, we have a, a healthy slope, at least. Um, and so these optical phonons may not contribute so much to directly to the transport of phonons. However, they do contribute to the storage of, uh, of thermal energy, so that's the heat capacity, and they also can contribute quite significantly to the interactions when we have electrons interacting with phonons. The optical branches can be the mediators between the two. All right, so that's it for week one. I appreciate your time and attention, and uh, I'll leave you. Bye.